I'm very happy to be here. Um, welcome to my talk, Designing Systems for Strategy Games. I'm Mark Nada, as she said, and let's get into it. Uh, she... Sounds good? Great. Well, I'll spoil it a little bit, but I'm gonna do a quick who am I, just give you some background. Um, I work for Firaxis, fine purveyor of strategy games. Um, I've been there since 2013. I'm currently, my title is a game director, um, but usually I've had designer in my title. I'm mostly doing design stuff. Um, early in my career, I did QA at a small company called Funkatron. Um, I wanna include that because it was a very valuable experience for me. QA is a very valuable part of game dev, so go QA. Um, most recently, and it'll make sense why I'm doing this weird order, <laughs> I worked on Marvel's Midnight Suns, where I was mostly content design. Uh, I joined a little late and helped get Abbey events and clubs going. Looking forward to that coming out. Hopefully you all check that out. Um, but now for the, for the meat of who I am, I guess. <laughs> Weird phrase to say. Um, it'll be my XCOM section of my career. Um, or as I like to call it, the games with alien faces on the covers. Um, so I started a Fraxis on, on XCOM 2. Um, for those who don't know XCOM, I'll, it's a tactical strategy game where you send out a squad of units, there's aliens involved, you go back to a base, there's a management layer where you're working, you're building up your base, you're doing stuff on the world map, and the loop and the, the magic of the game is you do stuff in the tactical layer, you get rewards, you take it back to your base, you build new stuff for your soldiers, take it back out into combat, get even more stuff, and then you spend like eight hours doing that. That's the XCOM loop. Um, so on XCOM 2, I was a designer programmer. I did procedural levels. I did, I balanced the hardest difficulty, so don't mess with me. Um, and I did a lot of implementation on the strategic layer, the base and the geoscape, um, as well as a bunch of other stuff, but those are some highlights. Uh, and then we made an expansion, and I was kind of a more senior designer role, um, where I got to design the Reaper class, which is a cool stealth new class we made, as well as doing uh, the Soldier Will System, which I'll talk about in this talk, and just a whole host of other stuff, like the Chosen on the Geoscape, yada, yada, yada. And then I was the lead designer in Chimera Squad, which was awesome, great team, and I touched like pretty much everything. I'll go over th some of those systems in this talk, but um, so those are my, my XCOM career so far. And to get into what we're gonna talk about today, I wanna give some definitions, get everyone in the right mind space, other producer words, synergy about what were the problem space we're gonna solve, um, give the main thesis of the talk and the big advice, and then the rest is mostly examples because I like giving examples instead of advice. So I'm giving one big advice and then not much more advice. And I'll use a bunch of images from Camera Squad because I think they're cool as my splash images, so let's get in the definitions. What is a strategy game? What is strategy? I'm not gonna answer that last one, mostly the strategy game. Um, so this is all to get us in the right mind space. So in a strategy game, decision making is what's most important to player outcomes, to consequences in the game. The player fantasy in a strategy game is feeling smart. To a lot of us that is a fantasy, including myself. Um, and I think a really important part is these two core skills at tests. One is forecasting your ability to plan. You know, nothing feels as good as a good plan coming together. Looking forward a number of turns, executing on that, getting the results you want. And the other just as important part is resourcefulness. Adjusting when the plans don't work, whether it's because you messed up or because a designer like me threw a wrench in your plan and it didn't work out. And this is kind of a spectrum where if you're too heavy on resourcefulness, you start kind of feeling like a puzzle game. If you're too heavy on forecasting, it's like a puzzle game. If you're too heavy on resourcefulness, maybe it's an action game. Or maybe you're, why even make a plan? <laughs> it's all, I have to adjust all the time. So it's, it's important to find the right balance there. And some coworker of mine once called it a series of interesting decisions, what a strategy game is. Um, that was Sid Meier, father of strategy games. He was more talking about games in general. That's kind of a big debate. You know, what do you mean by decisions? What do you mean by interesting? What do you mean by of? But uh, I think it really applies well to strategy games. You're always trying to get these interesting decisions out there in front of players. 
And that's kind of what you're designing these systems around. So what's system design? And I think we all know the really obvious answer is it's not content design. Um, but if we want to get more granular, it's the process of defining the structure around several game elements and how they interact towards a gameplay purpose. It's a very cold way of saying it, but um, I think that specific gameplay purpose part is really important. So in XCOM, we have a win system to make sure flags blow the same way as dust blows. That's not a gameplay purpose. But if you're making a golf game, the way the wind blows and how that works is a gameplay purpose. That's more gameplay system design. And now we're in the big advice. When I was asked to do this talk, initially I was like, systems design, I'm great at that, I'll nail it. Then I panicked. I don't know what I'm gonna do this talk about. What, am I a fraud? These things are very real possibilities. Um, but there's generally one main thing I wanna say. I don't like giving a lot of advice. I think mostly it depends on the experience for the game you're, you're working on if the advice applies. Like XCOM is a very difficult game, very harsh consequences, soldiers are dying. So advice like, well, positive reinforcement's always better than negative reinforcement. Like that's not the XCOM experience. <laughs> yeah. It's great that your soldier died. That's great for the experience of the game the XCOM wants. That's a very negative reinforcement, uh, which goes against this kind of maximum of always positive reinforcement. Um, so my big systems design advice comes from, I think, an alternate system design definition. And that's a trap. And why is it a trap? Because system design is fun. It's fun to get all these moving parts working together, these complex, intricate machinery, all these different voices singing this beautiful choir. It's just fun to do. Um, but it's not you that should be having fun. Systems don't exist for you, and they don't exist for their own right. They exist for someone else, and that's the player. So yes, I flew all the way across the world to tell you to think about the player. Mind, you know, I, I'm glad I could be here to make sure you know that, um, but I think it is, it is very important in strategy games where you can get so lost in mimicking how a real life phenomena works with gameplay elements, getting these very complex parts moving together, um, when in the end, it's really all about what that output is to the player. I'll touch on that a little bit. I wanna talk about depth versus complexity. They're very similar words. Um, but I'm gonna posit that what you really want with your strategy systems is depth. So depth, you know, there's a lot of layers to it. I, maybe it's first simple upon first glance, but going deeper and deeper, um, it's more, more complex. Like there's that other word, <laughs> it's related. Um, there's an aspect of mastery as you get deeper and deeper into it. Um, complexity is just how complicated something is. Um, and how I look at it, look at it is um, complexity is a cost in order to achieve depth. I think everyone likes depth. Complexity is neither good nor bad. I think to achieve a certain amount of depth in your decision making, in your systems, you're probably gonna need some complexity. Um, but it's important to remember that players can only handle a certain amount of complexity. Um, you know, it's gonna break down if it's too complex. Maybe it's the deepest thing in the world, um, but if it's too complicated for anyone to understand, who cares? Um, and when you get really deep systems that aren't that complex, that's when you start throwing words around like elegant. You know, that's what an elegant design. It's got like four parts and I'm making thousands of decisions about it. In a good way, I like to evaluate if I'm getting lost in the sauce with how complex I'm making something. And you're kind of going galaxy brain system designer mode. So when you get to the output of that system, ask yourself, can I just roll some dice and gotten about the same thing? And the answer may surprise you. <laughs> a lot of the times it's yes. And that's not to disparage dice. I make XCOM, I love dice. I think a lot of the depth of the decision making comes from the uncertainty of knowing that even when I do everything right, maybe it doesn't work out. And then it's like, well, did you do everything right? 
you didn't make a backup plan if that didn't work, you know, uh, or a backup plan to that backup plan to that backup plan, I digress. So now we're gonna get into the example portion. Um, and in this part, I'm going to kind of list a problem and then two, two ways that we approached it in different games. Um, I should say that I didn't do all this by myself. These aren't perfect designs, as you can probably guess by there being two different versions of them. Also, there's two examples of this, so it's more like two problems, four designs. Don't worry about that. Um, but, and uh, keep in mind that I'm not here to provide you with a lot of answers about how exactly to do systems design. I don't think it really works that way. What your game is trying to do isn't what my game's trying to do. I'm providing more questions instead of, I'm very Socratic, I'm giving you questions. Questions you can ask yourself to evaluate these systems if they are doing the thing that you want. So here's the first problem. Players are only using one squad's worth of soldiers. So this is a problem we had in XCOM 2 um, where players would just use only a single squad's worth. So they're just rolling out on the Sky Ranger every mission with the same group of soldiers, having a great time. It doesn't seem like a problem. Um, so, but why is it a problem? You're missing a lot, you're missing a lot of gameplay. There's so many classes in XCOM, if you're only taking four to six, you know, we had five base game classes with several um, upgrade paths. We had a DLC class. We had three more and more of the chosen with tons of different abilities. So you're just missing out on a lot of content if you're just stuck with the same ones. You're outpacing the difficulty curve. Um, XCOM is very much defined by these spikes in difficulty where you're doing really well and then all of a sudden Muton shows up and destroys you. That's great. Um, but if you're too powerful, the game just becomes less interesting. Uh, and I think the really bad one is squad wipes are catastrophic. So if you're doing, you know, probably really well, if you're only taking one squad, winning every mission, all of a sudden you get wiped. Now everyone that you ever take out on missions is dead. And you're sending out a bunch of rookies to fight, you know, these ultra aliens that just destroy you. And then you uninstall the game and you hate it. Um, I should say that XCOM does have already some built-in ways to deal with this with soldier death and wounds, which we love, as I said before, they're great. Um, but doesn't account for really good players if they're not dying or getting wounded. Or if they're really good by virtue of saving and loading, that's fine too, you know, they, they don't get it either. So can we do something about that? Um, and before I get into a particular solution to this, I wanna talk about what maybe do good solutions look like in general for systems and strategy games. So the first one is pretty obvious. You should leverage your game's fiction and experiential goals. I think experiential goals is a really obvious one. If it's not doing what you want <laughs> with your experience, it's probably not a good system. Um, and fiction, you know, it grounds it. If it's doing something that makes sense in the world of the game, doesn't feel artificial. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit as I describe some of the other systems. Uh, Another other one is slot in nicely with other game systems and content. I think this is particularly important for strategy games. I think a lot of the depth of strategy games that you get from mastering it comes from the different systems interacting with each other. Um, so having something that's extracted from that is probably not gonna be a great strategy system. Maybe a good system in a vacuum, but maybe not for the entire game. This one is both good for the system and for being able to make a game. Um, it doesn't require a lot of content to function, but it offers good opportunities to add content. Um, I think this one paired with the other one, um, you know, if there's something that doesn't slot in nicely and requires a lot of content, it's like you're in kind of mini game mode there, um, which are cool. Like I love fishing in my RPGs or playing, playing a card game, you know, in my middle of my fantasy RPG, but you know, that's not, I wouldn't call those great strategy systems, right? And the last one, I think this one is gonna save you because it always saves me, is have clear guide rails, pressure valves for your systems. Usually when you're making a system in a strategy game um, and you put it in, the problem isn't that it doesn't work, it's that it works too well and it just does the thing you designed it to do and derails the rest of your experience. <laughs> so knowing that that's a potential option 
um, putting in ways that you can limit it um, and guide it to really just um, fine tune the experience you want for players. So, back to the problem of players only using one squad um, on all their missions. In War of the Chosen, the expansion XCOM 2, we took this on um, with a system that I um, took point on called the Soldier Will system. And what that does is, it's pretty simple, you know, operationally. Every time you see a new enemy, or a soldier sees a new enemy, that, that soldier's will stat is lowered by a small random amount. A lot of stuff in XCOM 2 has like small random slush to it, just so it's unpredictable. So everything is by a small random amount in XCOM. Um, so when that will stat gets too low, they become tired, relatable, um, or shaken. Um, which means that they can't even go on missions anymore. But when they're tired, um, it's kind of this yellow state. Um, they're less reliable in content, combat, <laughs> in content, um, and they have a chance to gain negative traits. Um, so it's a really nice soft limiter, whereas you know, a soldier dying or being injured was like, you definitely can't use them. But now you're incentivized to take new soldiers on because taking this guy might be a risk. Um, we actually adjusted how the panic effects work so that they only randomly happen when your soldier is tired. So, um, and reliability is like at a, is a premium currency in XCOM, so taking those guys is a risk, but maybe they're your highest ranked guy and that's, that risk is worth it. Um, so it was a way to solve this without being really heavy handed and adding a lot more nuance to the decision about your squad. So let's look at this with our, our four Questions we had before. Does it fit in the fiction experiential goals? I think it fits pretty well. It simulates the mental attrition of combat after combat against alien overlords that have taken over your planet. It's kind of weird before that you could just constantly go in and just be like, all right, ready for the next one. I'm back from the ship, let me get back on that ship. Um, so I think it fits fictionally and you know, fits the struggling against impossible odds experience that XCOM is really all about. We already had a will set. It was basically just a stat check against panic effects or psionic attacks, but now it's like a whole thing. It slotted in really well. We already had panic effects, but now why they happen is clear. Um, and that just kind of rounded out that entire system, which was a very XCOM thing. It's always, it makes the player panic when your soldier panics because they might squad wipe you. Um, a lot of stuff like that in XCOM. Um, and then let us add negative traits. I don't think, and panic effects, I don't think they were required for the system to work. I think stat debuffs, unreliability in combat is enough to get it across the line, but the opportunity to add flavor-like negative traits, which are like, oh, he's scared of snakes. <laughs> he got constricted by a viper and I was scared of snakes, um, adds to this storytelling that we like to do in XCOM, where there's a lot of emergent storytelling where, oh, I, I remember that guy. He, he got constricted by that snake. That's why he's scared of him. Um, so it worked out really well. And as far as the, the guide rails and pressure valves, we allowed items to, to help with it, as well as we really had to put in just like hard limits on long missions, because basically you would go out on a really long mission, see a bunch of enemies, it doesn't matter how random it is, and everyone would come back and they're just totally blasted. And you know, that wasn't the experience we wanted either. It worked too well. You know, everyone I took out on the mission is now unavailable. That's not what we wanted out of the system. So, just just put in some limits. Who who cares? You know, you you are making the experience for the player. And then the other way we solved it in Chimera Squad, which is a totally different game, even though it's XCOM. You know, it's more of a, it's not as desperate as War of the Chosen and XCOM 2. It's more of a, you know, through cooperation we can do anything kind of experience. Um, we had agent training. So at certain rank thresholds, training becomes available. And when you're training, can't go on missions. Um, and it was basically really simple stuff like stat upgrades and new abilities. Um, so it was nice, you know, you want those new things and they're available first to your highest ranked people, take them out for a bit, <laughs> you know? What's the worst that could happen? Um, so let's evaluate this again. Does it, does it fit the narrative? Does it fit the fiction experience goals? Yes. You know, in this game, you're this new untrained squad. You should do some training. We already had a paradigm of staffing units, so it fit right into that, that system. And we didn't have 
soldiers out of missions with wounds anymore because we had a limited set of unique characters. So we had this wound system which needed to be, you could staff to heal, but now it was a cool choice with whether I wanted to heal or train. And like the last one, I think this works with just stat upgrades, so not a big content ask. But it let us add some new fun abilities which worked out really well because we were all about characters and their abilities. Um, and it was really easy to tweak, like how we started up with, I think, with like, you could train unlimited. You could just keep boosting your health. What could go wrong? This guy's got a, a thousand health, unkillable. Um, but we made it so you can do like three per soldier. Um, and very clear, like, at what ranks those were, just to fit the kind of pacing we wanted. That was really easy to do. Um, second problem. Um, this is like a classic XCOM problem. Players are moving too slowly and cautiously through missions. Why are they doing that? Because they're gonna die. <laughs> you should move pretty slow. Um, you reveal new enemies, they, they spread out, they shoot at you, it's bad. Um, so we took this on in XCOM 2, um, but first, why is it a problem? Um, unsurprisingly, it makes the game go really slow, you know? just moving one space, then overwatching, moving one space, then overwatching, you know, isn't quite the pace for missions that we wanted out of XCOM. Some people dig it, um, but I think they're psychopathic. Um, the decisions become really uninteresting, just like this is kind of a theme where the optimal way to play is this very set routine where I just take one step in Overwatch. That's not that interesting decision that we want in a strategy game. And ultra risk averse play style. XCOM 2 is about, you're on the offense now. Aliens took your planet, well we're taking it back. And kind of tiptoeing through the map. Um, not wanting to take any risks is really like not the experience that we were going for. So, in XCOM 2, we solved it with concealment and timers. And I'll talk about timers, <laughs> don't worry. Um, so. It's very simple, if you're going too slow, well now you can't. <laughs> you must complete the mission objective before the timer runs out. It's just a turn timer, you know, you got eight turns to get and pick up a box of an alien thing, get rid of all the enemies. Um, and then to help with this, we added concealment, which is kind of a light stealth mode where you start missions unrevealed to enemies, you can do a nice ambush. Um, so you're able to move farther without risk, but they won't, their line of sight is more limited while you're in concealment. Um, so I think this is the part where we should talk about what, what does and doesn't work about the system. I think it does fit resistance themes of your kind of this guerrilla strike force, concealed, um, and more aggressive experiential goals, but timers feel pretty artificial, like, because they are. It's, just, it's a UI element up there. Why did that timer site start when I was concealed? Um, it's something we adjusted on in War of the Chosen, but, uh, it's, you know, adding time pressure with like, oh, they're gonna take all the boxes away before, you know, you're gonna get less of a reward, or they're, they're killing people, get in there fast, and, you know, more stuff that fit in the fiction instead of um, just a hard timer. And Concealment kind of had this problem where it became too much of a stealth game when our first implementation. We're coming across enemies and fighting them with something you didn't wanna do, which is like really bad for XCOM, because <laughs> all of our work is going into making these awesome abilities that feel awesome to use. Um, so it became more of an ambush mechanic where like there's this binary mode where it turns on or off instead of being like, well that guy lost concealment but that guy still has it and that guy still has it and those enemies are in yellow alert and those are in orange. It was just too much. Like we're not a stealth game. Um, I think the safety of concealment combined nicely with the unpredictable nature of procedural maps. We're adding in maps that players can't become familiar with and um, now you can just explore them at less risk move quickly, combine really nicely with that. Um, adding content to that, um, class and ability designers really able to key off of concealment. Um, there's a whole branch of the ranger tree that's about being stealth. You can get back in it, that's the one guy where like, well, it's okay if one guy does it. <laughs> that guy can get back into stealth by himself, um, having you know items and stuff that key off it too. And as far as like guide rails, Timers are the easiest thing in the world this week. <laughs> you know, you add one or minus one. And concealment, um, 
it being binary made it more manageable. You could start missions. Like maybe this mission doesn't even have concealment. We gave a lot of power to our level designers to do that. Um, so it was pretty, it had some, some handles in there as well. But it's mostly we just used it a lot because it was, it helped, it fit really well with how our mission design worked. In Chimera Squad, we did breach mode and an encounter system. It's kind of, we solved the problem by making it not a problem at all. So we removed any in between time of combat. You just start encounters by busting down doors and breaching into rooms. And it offers this really nice spectacle. You know, it's this kind of back of the box type feature. And you get a nice set of strategic choices as well where, where do I go? What abilities do I pick? Do I use, do I throw a nade in there first? So it had a lot of nice cool stuff with that. Evaluate this against it. It definitely fit, XCOM Chimera Squad kind of theme was let's be a smaller and faster XCOM. So it fits that really well. <laughs> You're in these small rooms and busting in. Um, and we had this urban setting in the game, so it fit in the fiction of like, oh, you'd have to be good at breach and clear tactics. Um, yeah, and it fit with our level design of like, we just were like, I want to be in buildings. We never see the inside of buildings in XCOM 2. Let's get in there. Um, and it's fit nicely with our unique characters as well. Um, I think this one, it was like kind of a bigger content ask, so it didn't do this part really well. It required breach bonuses, I think, to work at all. You know, picking this door over that door was really boring if, <laughs> if there was no reason like that this door was better than that door. Um, but it did offer a lot of opportunities for adding items and abilities. Um, so it was kind of a wash there. But it, since, like I said, it's this big back of the box feature, I think it worked out. And as far as, you know, guide rails, level design had a lot of control over how many we did. If they wanted to put four window breaches that everyone had to use, or just one door everyone had to use, you could breach one to three times per mission. There's a lot of ways if, to shake it up if they felt like it wasn't working out. So I want to touch on economy design because it's like the kind of system design of strategy games. I'm not going to get super into it because your economy is probably doing different stuff than what my economy is doing. I'm not talking about money. <laughs> um, but game economies are important game system for strategy games. Um, and I think about them from a player focus lens as, as the theme of this talk of the kind of more re rewards progression systems. Uh, I'm getting stuff that I'm spending to improve my character, my squad, um, buying, selling, so that I can get more powerful. Like I said, don't ask me for real economic advice. I don't know, all right? I have to use a program to do my taxes. Um, key terms to keep in mind with game economies are resources. That's what's in your economy. Faucets, that's where the resources are coming from. And you guess it sinks. That's where the resources go. Uh, I mostly think in these terms, um, they really just provide a nice framework when you're thinking about your game economy. Um, when you're making an economy, like I said, I can't do it for you here, but I want to give you two questions you can ask yourself to help you guide how you do it. So what does the player value most? This like leads to a lot of easy answers for what you should give players, as you could guess. So in XCOM, they love direct improvements to the squad. I get a new legendary weapon that that guy can just hold and take out, that's awesome. Um, indirect improvements to the squad, building up the engine of your base. Between these two, there's always a lot of great, oh, I can get this great thing now, but I'll be more efficient later if I get these indirect improvements. Three, not losing the game. It sometimes comes up, um, aliens are always doing something. Sometimes, like, all right, I'll deal with that now that it's been simmering there too long. Four, winning the game. <laughs> Strategy players are a weird breed where winning the game is cool, um, but, you know, they're happy to just be inside the systems, immersed in them. You know, if I happen to win the game, that's great. And then five, all the way to the bottom, strategic layer only rewards which are like mostly just designer gates where like you need to get more power for that facility or you need more resistance contacts. It's all for like, so those are more guide rails for other game systems. <laughs> They're not that cool for players. Um, the other question, what is the core experiential loop of your game? So in XCOM, it's going out on missions, baby. You wanna go out there with your squad and bring back the stuff that as rewards. That's the core loop. So, taking those two answers, 
um, from those questions, mission rewards are XCOM's main faucet. All the major kind of choices you're making, are they're the main economic choice you're making in XCOM. Do I want scientists or engineers? Do I want supplies? Or do I want some extra soldiers? Um, and then those choices get more and more complicated. Now the aliens are doing something connected to this one. This one's hard as well, and you know, get this other bonus. So they, instead of being like, oh, it's short term versus long term, it's like short and long term versus not losing and then also winning. And so the decisions pile on and pile on. Um, but the key thing to take away is these kind of questions will lead you to what do my players care about? What do I need to give them as resources? What are the faucets of my game? And, you know, sinks comes pretty obvious from that. You know, you can spend the resources to buy those things they care about. And then, you know, the main faucets, I think, of the game come from what is that core expansion loop. You really want the player to be engaged with that really interesting choice in the main chunk of your game. You don't want there to be some auxiliary, auxiliary system. Um, why am I making my main economic choice on this side thing? And the, the last section before the conclusion, picking systems. If you are in the position where you get to pick systems through your game, it's really fun and difficult. <laughs> but I'll, I'll guide you through kind of some couple ways that you can deal with it. So one, I think this comes up a lot, especially making strategy games, is there's legacy expectations. Making games in an established IP or genre comes with expectations, but players think this should be in there. XCOM has a bunch of these. Um, what you need to do as the person making this decision is evaluate what that legacy system is doing and if that fits with your new player experience or goals of the game. So going from XCOM 2 to Chimera Squad, um, research became assembly. Research, there were points where like, do we need research? And research was providing a consistent choice on a beat. It was a very clear progression marker for players, which we wanted. It, it was kind of the main economic play style choice where I could, oh, I could go after, I could go after armor instead of weapons. My whole middle of the game is different. Um, so just fit all these things. It was doing these things that we still wanted. So we kind of, we still use it. Same with engineering becoming supply, where it's the main sink of the game. I'm spending my most money to buy, you know, guns and armor for my soldiers. And it's kind of, the choice is almost like, which soldier do I like the best? <laughs> you know, I bought him all the nicest stuff, which is like, I think a really fun choice to do in XCOM. So we're like, oh, I still want that. So let's do it. And then there, there's some things that didn't quite make it, like base building. Some of this was due to, you know, time constraints, but we, we had some parts of that that we want to incorporate. And we did that in field teams and the, in the strategy map, but you know, that system didn't get pulled over wholesale because it didn't fit our experiential needs for the game. And the last, uh, I think the main way that I think is really fun to do as an exercise, and it's definitely not, doesn't happen this smooth in, in development, it's gonna take months and months, um, but it's what I like to call the decision cascade. Each major experiential decision you make for the player affects decisions down the line. So basically what you're doing is you're like listening to your game, stepping in the shoes of the player, and you know, thinking about what does that decision mean for the decisions down the line. So let's do come here, squad. Like I said, smaller, faster XCOM. Awesome. Okay, well, we're doing missions in tight interior spaces because of that. You know, it's literally smaller and faster. There's less space. Awesome. Uh, this led to encounter systems where there's no time in between combat, and um, because we were in interior spaces, and all of a sudden we're moving between rooms, and enemies are just taking cover behind doors, and I've had 30% shots everywhere, and it sucked. So, like, take out that middle part, now we got encounters in breach mode. Um, small rooms led to interleave turns. Each unit takes their turn individually now. When I, we had team turns in for a bit, and we're making Premier Squad, and you just obliterated the enemy. <laughs> Whoever got to go first, you know, there's like eight of you in a room. If you get a full turn of four of your guys going, you just destroy them. So we're like, well, that's impossible. Let's make it so less, only one person go at a time. Um, this led to unique characters. Now that only one unit at a time was taking a turn, 
Returns are really boring. <laughs> like, right, like XCOM soldiers is pretty much move, shoot guy with sometimes they throw a grenade. Um, so we needed more crazy abilities. Each class is unique so that they, each turn you come to a character, they have completely different capabilities than, than the last. Unique characters led to no permadeath. This was one, a kind of a scope thing. We didn't, if you, too many people died, you just run out of people. We can't, we can't make that many unique characters. Um, and uh, no permadeath led to a wound system. Um, now that when you got kind of fatally wounded and that maybe something that would have killed you in a previous XCOM, now you just took kind of a scar. And you could heal that, but it gave you this, this persistent bonus. So there's still consequences to playing poorly, but it just wasn't that, you know, the soldier you customized as your mom or something died forever. Um, now that we have this wound system, now we have androids. You get knocked out in a mission, you gotta replace that soldier. That guy gets, he's bleeding out, he gets evacuated. Now you have androids in the game. So when you're in the middle of a mission, an android can come in and finish the rest of the mission. So, uh, and that goes on and on. There's like an android upgrade system now. Um, so we basically said, I want a smaller Fresno XCOM, and now there's androids in the game. You know, that's kind of a crazy cascade of decisions. So, in conclusion, um, I know I've, I've just gave a lot of examples and hit you with a lot of of things, but I really want to bring the focus back to kind of the thesis of the talk. So I think this is going to probably be insulting, and I'm sorry. Be being a game designer, I think, is fundamentally pretty simple. You're finding answers to two main questions. What are we doing? And this is kind of something that only senior lead side people get to answer. What are the experiential goals? And, you know, what, what is this game meant to do? Um, and then how are we going to do it? what is the implementation to get to those goals? Um, and my point with systems design is it's so easy to get lost in that second question. You know, how are we gonna do it? Well, we got this crazy system that can do all these cool things. It can be really complex. It can, you know, I can stroke my ego by how cool this system is. Um, but like I said, what's more important is that when you're evaluating the how, it's against this what. So you have to make sure that what you're doing is framed by player experiential goals. If you do that, um, you'll find that the game becomes, words are flying around like intuitive, like accessible, and like, oh, easy to learn, difficult to master. I think a lot of times strategy gets this kind of like niche or like, oh, it's, it's a little, too. I don't get it, you know? I don't get strategy games. I think a lot of it comes from this kind of thing, where if you're not focused on what the outputs of your systems are for players, you can get lost in this complexity when you're really looking for is just depth. Thank you. I'm gonna put up a QR code, or you? Oh God. You wanna come up here? Sorry. Um, we have a QR code for survey about the talk. If you liked it, please answer. If you didn't like it, don't worry about it. But yeah, I, I wanna open up. I went a little long-ish, but if people have questions, I'd be happy to, to answer. Um, I don't know what the system is. Are we gonna bring mics to people? Okay, I, have, I see people running around. <laughs> So, folks, we have about uh, 10 questions. We can do about 10 minutes, so about five questions for Mark. Um, so, Vijay is at the back. Just raise your hands, whoever has a question. We're going to do one question, so per speak, per question or so, no follow ups, please. Okay. Uh, anyone at the back? Let's start with that. Vijay, you see anyone there? Just, you know. Uh, folks, do take a moment to fill up this survey. It's a one question survey. It helps us get great speakers like Mark down for you every year if we know that you like this. Uh, hi, Mark. This is Vipul. Uh, before the question, I just want to say I love Chimera Squad, and I can't wait for Midnight Suns. Just looks great. Uh, I just wanted to ask that for Chimera Squad, you reworked a lot of the systems uh, from XCOM 2. But uh, for Midnight Suns, you had to leave a lot of those systems behind. So uh, when do you know, like, uh, yeah, we'll, we can rework this system for this uh, next game? and we have to leave this system behind, like we cannot work with this anymore. Like how do you tell 
like at this point we cannot do it anymore. So the question is how can you, when you're taking kind of these legacy systems over, yeah. how do you tell when maybe something doesn't work? Yeah. Could you shed some light on that? Yeah. I think, um, I like to be very goal oriented with design. I think it's a great practice to get into where, and it, go, it can be very high level or not, but the process is, is like a lot of things in design where you just need to be very clear and thoughtful about your experiential goals of what any system's trying to do, what the game's trying to do. Um, and what you do is usually a designer will make them and you'll align with the rest of the team on them, whether it's with the spec or anything else. Um, but if you come across a system and you have these clear goals that are well thought out that you've all agreed on and you evaluate what that system is doing, and if that doesn't, you already all agreed on what those goals are and if this doesn't do it, um, it's fine to cut. I think it's, it's a, not as simple as that sometimes because, you know, there's, there'll be systems in the game that just like maybe players just like expected to be there. And I, I don't think it's like terrible if those remain. Like, um, I know that like some games like, oh, like Three Houses still has weapon degradation when I mostly care about dating people at the school, but my weapons are degrading. And it's like, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's, it's okay if you, if you port stuff over, but the process is basically like really evaluating what you're trying to do and seeing if the goals of that system align with that. Hi, uh, great talk by the way, thanks for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So most of the strategy games have initial curve when the player joins the game, like first time experience is quite complex. Uh, how do you go towards like simplifying it for every new game? Like how do you make it like that player can jump into the game effortlessly as much as possible? Yeah, so the question is how do you get the bring in new players, get that first time user experience feeling smooth. So I think it is very difficult with strategy games. Um, generally, uh, what you wanna do is like, we call it kind of like blossoming out. Like you don't expose them all to everything right away. Um, it's tough sometimes because it's a strategy game and sometimes systems de depend on each other, right? Um, so I, I think that's like one of the, the main aspects that strategy games can really work on. But the, the idea is basically like, players can only really handle, you know, a few new things at once. And you really want to hammer those home, get them to have to engage with it somehow, so make a decision around it so they, they actually are not, or like encouraged to understand what that thing is, not just told, um, and then move on to another small set of things. And then eventually that builds out into your complex connection of all these systems eventually. Um, but that's the general idea. I mean, it's nothing groundbreaking, which is you kind of want to blossom out um, the complexity as time goes. Um, and finding that sweet spot of like, how much to, can we take out so that's still Hello. like a fun game is, is important. My, um, hello, my name is Nalin Savara and I'm from a company called Dark Sun Technologies. Uh, I loved your talk, Mark. Thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, my question is, roughly how long did it take to make these things that you described for XCOM and how much time did it take for Chimera Squad and how many people were there in the team? Like you mentioned that you had a specific role in one game and a different kind of role in another game where you had a set of things that were your ownership. But what was the total size of the team and how long did it take? How many months did each of these take? Uh, I don't know if I'm explicitly allowed to say exactly how many, but, um, you know, XCOM was, um, XCOM 2 was like a pretty large team over several years. Um, and I'll just say with Chimera Squad, it was less people and less time. But we were building off a thing that already existed a little bit. We changed a bunch of stuff. So that, that comes into play where we had like a kind of working game that we were able to take a sledgehammer to, but um, the, the scope of the resources was, was small. I go, sorry, I can't be more specific, but. Um. Specific number of people in the team that's involved in designing these strategy things. No? So even if you give a ballpark figure, if it's confidential, like whether they were three, well, four people yeah. or 10, 20 people or 50, 60 people. Yeah, I mean, um, so designer-wise, we had, you know, 
the design teams weren't gigantic. You know, it was three or four people doing kind of major design, and then we had a, a few level designers, and that, that's pretty consistent for both Ice Film things. It's more the the scale more comes from how many content people and engineers are able to implement a lot of things. Um, but design team, the design teams at Fractions are generally pretty small. Um, generally, not not always the case, but those were, you know. Three or four people were the main designers of, of kind of XCOM 2 and Chimera Squad. Uh, we had some questions over here as well. If anyone would like to ask Mark, uh, please give your name and also speak into the mic. Do we have anyone on this side? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, also, you amazing talk. Thank you for that. But uh, I wanted to uh, say, so I believe that a strategy game could get very boring if the system becomes predictable. And if the player is able to apply the same strategy over and over again to win, which is why I also believe randomness helps the player like be more on their toes, keep them wary. But randomness can also feel unfair if not done well. So in your opinion, what is the right way to do randomness in strategy? Yeah, well, I mean, it's maybe there's a loaded question asking XCOM, because it's like, just roll those dice, and if it's 95 and you miss, you miss. But I, I get what you're saying, yeah, it, it is tough. Like, how, how do you do randomness right and make it feel good? Um, I think a lot of it comes with how you, you kind of box that randomness in the game. Like, how, how do you message it to the player? You know, XCOM, you know, doesn't have, I mean, it has a lot of, generally like some random slush, but really like the main randomness you think about in XCOM is like in this very, we zoom in, you're looking at an alien over the shoulder and it goes, that's 85, do you wanna do it? Like we really zoom in on that choice. Um, and I think that's why it feels acceptable is like, you knew the risks, <laughs> we told you up front. Um, I think when randomness starts to feel bad is when it like comes out of nowhere at you. You know, you get totally screwed by something that randomly happens. Um, and I, I don't think there's like really a set way that randomness can feel good or bad. I, I think it mostly is, is about how you message that randomness to the player where, um, you know, with XCOM, it's very upfront. So, you know, part of being a good XCOM player that's understood is like, you know that you can miss that shot, so what else are you doing to make sure that this turn isn't a disaster if that doesn't work out? Um, so that's a good question, you know. Uh, thank you. So we actually have one more question. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So uh, great talk, by the way. Thank so you. my question is, uh, while designing systems, do you start with something simple and keep adding layers while testing? Or do you make something really complex and try to cut down things from it? Like, how do you approach when you are given a brief? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, there's nothing set in stone, but um, you always start with, you know, the goals, like I was saying, but I think generally you end up going complex to simple. Like, you'll try to, you know, I gave this advice about not trying to get in there and just have a bunch of fun and make a complex thing, but you generally still kind of do that because you're like, oh, it wouldn't be cool if we simulated this you know, like there's a version of XCOM where you're simulating wind and, you know, line of sight with like foliage in your way. And then in the end, it's probably like the dice roll is enough to get that across of how good or bad a shot is. Um, so generally you kind of like are probably just from human nature, you kind of put in too much complexity and then probably peel back. Um, and I think that becomes easier when, as you're implementing, you kind of get a, a better idea of what that core experience of the system is supposed to be. like. You don't always know all the way up front. You know, you'll have the best guess at the goals and you'll, you'll adjust them as maybe something awesome happens while you're playing and, and those goals need to be adjusted because this new gameplay experience is even better. Um, so that's generally like, oh, it's doing all this stuff that actually isn't cool, not, but in this one edge case, it does this thing that I really like. So let's, let's cut all that cruft out and you know, really center it around the things that we want. So that's generally how it goes. All right, I think we are 